Is everybody in? Is everybody in? DS-106 is about to begin. Okay. It's my best, Morrison. What is DS-106? Uh, DS-106 is awesome. Let me start with that, and then let me move from that. DS-106 is a class that was started by Jennifer Pollack. Uh, I remember that I helped her teach the first summer class of it, and it's a digital storytelling class. Um, in the computer science program. And I'd just like to thank the computer science program officially for letting DTLT experiment with this class and being so open-ended. They may want to stop the class after this presentation, <laughs> but still, everything they've given us up to this point has been really appreciated. Um, what the S106 is, is it's an experiment in thinking about a class where we ask the students to frame their narrative on their own space in their own way. Every student who comes into this class gets their own web hosting space, their own domain. And for us, the digital story is about them framing their identity out in the open. I send an email to every student saying, this is going to be an open class. Prepare yourself. If that doesn't work, drop it. But what they do is through a course of study, they frame a series of different media, whether it be audio, video, design, visual, um, mashups, uh, fan fiction, they go through a series of assignments. Now this semester was different. We've taught it two different semesters, both in the fall of 2010 and the spring of 2010. This semester we decided, okay, we have these students. I was able this semester to team teach with Martha, which has been an amazing process. Hopefully we could talk about that. Um, but we decided, you know what? Thanks to Tom Woodward, Alan Levine, Tom Woodward, who's here, Alan Levine, and Martha, we sit, we had a planning in early December. We said, how would we go about this? And the idea came to open the entire course up for anyone who wanted to take it. So we had 75 students between our three sections, but we had another 250 people out in the Ethernet all over the world who were actually contributing to the site and to the course as they saw fit. Give you an interesting example, two members of our audience right now, and actually who are integral parts of this presentation, or not only this presentation, this conference, um, Tom Woodward and Tim Owens actually started us off with a design that Martha's going to talk about, this submit an assignment. We had this new idea that Martha programmed beautifully where anyone could submit an assignment that anyone else could do. So Tim Owens, having a background in design, and also Tom, having a background in design, started throwing out these design assignments. A month before the course actually started, we had 200 posts from people all over the world doing animated GIFs. They just went crazy. So the class started to explode before it even started. And one of the things that I started to think about is we have this entire momentum moving in before we ever meet our students. And once we met our students, there was about 150 to 200 people who potentially would comment and read their work. So what we had done is we had used our network and the network at large to create an experience for our students that when they come into this class immediately, there's an open, connected network that I am not going to be a single node in, nor is Martha. We're going to be one amongst many. And the work they do is going to reverberate throughout this network. So I'm going to hand it over to Martha. I have more thoughts, but I'm going to hand it over to Martha and show you, to some degree, how we designed the site, DS-106, and then how it kind of came in as a course that was open, connected, and very much social, and moved away from the disconnection that often can happen with the course, although not always. Um, so about, uh, I also want to preface all of this by saying this was my first time teaching. <laughs> so if you can imagine, trial by fire. <laughs> this is it. Um, so uh, going into this semester, I didn't really know what the heck I was doing. And, um, and Jim decided that he was going to invite the whole world to take DS-106. And what started happening very quickly um, as people participated is, as Jim said, they, people were coming up with assignment ideas, partly because we were saying, hey, do you have cool assignment ideas? And people did. Um, and we said, at one point, we said, we have to figure out how to capture this stuff and use it because this is really rich and this is really interesting and valuable for us as well as for anybody who's interested in digital storytelling and interested in, in using these technologies to kind of communicate meaning and teach students how to do that. Um, so we came up with this idea of an, an assignment repository. So basically, this is the DS-106 website, which is a pretty straightforward blog site. 
um, when you come here, you just see the latest posts um, from across the network. Um, all of the users on this site have registered on this blog, so they have their little avatar that shows up, and they have a kind of a blurb of the post. And then if you click continue reading, what it actually does is take you to their site, wherever that may be. Um, and it's not here. It's, it's hosted wherever they want to. Um, but we decided we wanted to have a way for people to submit an assignment. So we threw a together Google Form. Um, and it's very straightforward. Give it a title, give it a description, put it in one of these um, categories that we had set up for, um, for the course, visual, audio, video, mashup, fanfic, design, writing, and web. Um, and if you have an example of what it might look like, let us know what it is. If you want to tell us who you are, give us your name. And that was it. Um, and then what would happen, um, actually, on the back end, if anybody cares, uh, this is a Google form, so this gets ingested into a Google spreadsheet. Um, where it then is, can be exported in a variety of different formats. So what I did is I was able to take um, the, the data that in that spreadsheet and pull it back into the course blog. Um, and, and every assignment became a post on the blog then. And as it was coming in, I was able to assign particular categories to each post so that I could then do interesting things in terms of the presentation of those assignments as they were coming in. So to give you an example, this is the visual design category. And each of these little boxes with a gray header is an assignment that was submitted by somebody on the course. Um, you see the title. You see the description. If there is a screenshot um, or an, an image associated, you can see that. Um, and then as the assignments were coming in, uh, uh, categories were, were um, assigned to them, um, in this case, so visual assignments all have the category visual assignments, but they also have a unique category, visual assignments 24. And what we told students who are playing along on the class is, if you're going to do this assignment on your blog, use that category. And then when we pull your posts into the course blog, we now can find all of the people who did this assignment as well. So not only can we see the assignments were, that were submitted, we can see the submissions to the assignment. Does that make sense? Um, and to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, we get to this level where this is a great assignment too. This was actually submitted by one of Jim's students. Um, and the idea is to use um, it's stories written in Windows Media Player or iTunes, any, any music player that you might have on your computer. And the idea is look at your music library on your computer, the titles of those songs, and write a story, a narrative um, out, of, uh, out of those titles. Um, and this was, uh, this was Sarah, right? Who oh, this was uh, Colleen Trace. This was, okay. This was another student. Um, so she put up this assignment like fairly early on in the class. Yeah, they did it on their own. We didn't even bother. Them. And people loved it. People loved this assignment. So if you scroll down on the actual assignment page, each of these is a submission um, that people made to this assignment. And the posts will take you back to their blog post where you can see the completion of this assignment. And um, we had some students in our classes do this, but we also had lots of people all over the world actually do this assignment because it really resonated with people. They really liked this, um, the idea of this assignment. Um, so we were able to basically, on the website, use, the, use the, the presentation of this information to help foster that community and help build that community. Um, as of last week, I think we have 125, 125 assignments that have been su submitted over the course of the semester. Um, and we've been talking about how to make those available. I mean, you can come and you can see them here in, on the web page, but we'd also like to make those available in some kind of open format so that anybody who's teaching a digital storytelling class or any class that might use digital storytelling as a component can, can kind of scan these assignments and see if there's one um, that they could use or tweak or, or, um, or modify for their own purposes. So it, not only had, did this end up being a huge component of our class, but we feel like what we've actually ended up generating is this repository of assignments and ideas for faculty um, anywhere who are interested in these kinds, of, these kinds of activities. Yeah, that's amazing. And one of the things that happened as a result is students, Colleen, for example, put in this assignment. And 55 people, some from Indonesia, some from Portugal, all over the world did her assignment. What does that say? And Colleen comes and she looks and she was saying, like, I couldn't believe. Once I saw five, I was amazed. Once I saw 50, I was blown away. And it's interesting to put them in a situation to come up with something creative that other people can do and then the community. Because then we had Jordan Kroll take that assignment and say, okay, do that, but then use Flickr images to create the narrative visually. They were building and mashing up each other's assignments. Well, one of the other side effects that we never dreamed of with this class that came out and kind of blew my mind, and there's two um, things I want to talk about. The first is DS-106 radio. DS-106 radio is interesting because come week one, we had done some planning in December. Come week one, there was no radio. 
Come week two, I put out a Twitter message basically like, you know what DS106 radio needs? Um, DS106 needs a radio station. Because I didn't want to use Illuminate at all. I hate all things Blackboard. Illuminate's part of Blackboard. People are like, you should do a synchronous session using Illuminate. And I was like, oh, no, I will not. And so what we basically said is, what is another way? And Grant Potter, who lives in Vancouver, B no, who lives in um, Canada, in BC, northern BC, um, saw my tweet on the radio. He was part of the open class, and this guy is a genius. He went and he got the server together, and he, got, he said, hey, I got a radio station for DS-106. I was like, what? He's like, I have a radio station for DS-106. Here's how you use it. He gave me all the credentials. He set up a Dropbox so anyone could upload whatever they wanted. It would go into Auto DJ, and regularly we had a 24-7 radio station, which we then changed our syllabus to have students create radio shows over the course of the semester. It was mind-blowing. Well, that radio station became a whole nother platform for us to think about how to use mobile devices, how to use our own computers as broadcasting, and it changed my relationship to how I was thinking about the technology. I'd been so blog-centric. And when Grant Potter came and we opened this course, it changed my whole idea about how I've been approaching all this stuff. Well, build on what Grant Potter did. Week seven, Tim Owens, who's actually in the audience today, was like, well, if we could do radio, why can't we do TV? And so Tim Owens went behind the scenes, and he actually designed a DS-106 TV station that people started to do live. And what's amazing is the synchronicity. At the same time, Andy Rush had been designing a kit for UMW DTLT and also for the University of Relations. So it's actually for the University of Relations <laughs> Department, but DTLT doesn't want to give it up. Um, and it basically was a series of video equipment that was cheap, that was using a Mac and this application called Wirecast so that we could do professional-like TV shows and put them out into the DS-106 environment. This all happened around the world, close to home, as in Farmville, or even here at DTLT, but also in UBC, in Indonesia, in Portugal. Talk about Scott. And people, Scott, Scott oh, Lowe. Scott Lowe. So the other thing about DS-106 radio is you all know what happened in Japan. Well, we had an American expat in Tokyo. Who's the first podcaster in Japan. First podcaster ever, who found out about DS-106 radio from Alan Levine's blog and was interested because he's a radio guy. Well, he actually was doing a radio class in Tokyo and he said, you know what, I want to get on the radio. He brought his class on our radio and then him and his students reported on the after effects of the earthquake in Japan live to the community of DS-106. And it was amazing that we were starting to get field reports from Australia. We had P uh, Peter Rowan, or Rowan Peter, who goes out with his iPod or his iPhone. He goes out and he says, this is what the crickets sound like in Melbourne. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> we started to get these experiences by opening it up that changed everyone's ideas of storytelling. Now, if you ask me what digital storytelling is, I can't tell you. And that's an important part of this class. We are so much more kind of thinking about the fragments of narrative and creativity that may make a story that we maybe don't see, but actually fills in the holes of some of the ways we've been thinking about it. And Martha and I were talking about this yesterday when we heard Michael West talk mm -hmm. about this idea of production, this idea of media, this idea of reframing the experience for the student in your class. DS-106, in many ways, we hadn't theorized it like that. We were purely experimenting but it goes to the heart of that. We wanted to put the camera, the audio, the video, the web stories, like his forum about we, his example about we forum. Remember that awesome example where there was a total copycat site that someone had gone out and the made yes -man. even yeah. better? Yeah. That was an assignment that Martha Burtis, who's right here, I'll let her talk about. Martha Burtis, you know her, right? Um, she came up with, and we had students who had no skills taking the New York Times site and creating alternative site. This was during the Japanese uh, earthquake. One of the students basically did a whole series of events that said everything's fine, right? The, the, the recession's over, there's no earthquake. It was like this sunny version of the, New, of the New York Times where everything in the world seemed fine. And when the students realized that they could intervene in the media and, and make it their own and subvert, <laughs> it changed so much of how we thought about this. And the fact is, is how are we using the other media? Why aren't we, and then I'll hand it over, why aren't we as universities using something like web radio or web TV 
to show what's happening at this community. One of the things that came up in the workshop Tom Wilber did today is we don't know what's happening in other classes. We don't know what other people are doing. You know what? It costs us nothing, a little bit of time, to sit down with a faculty member and say, hey, what are you doing in your class? Make a TV show out of it. Why don't you and your students create content for the TV station that UNW has? Create content for the radio station that UNW has. Why don't we use these two platforms as a teaching and learning tool? They're very cheap, and they're very powerful. UMW can be its own media mogul, right? We can use the media. We can control the vertical <laughs> and the horizontal. Um, I'm just pulling up. I got to log Andy Rush out because he doesn't remember to log himself out. So um, I'm going to put the mic down a second so I can log in. Um, one of the things that we did at the end of the year, because we know people like um, to do data analysis, because it's all about the numbers, really. Yeah. Um, well, we did one thing. We did something early on in the semester. We put up a Google form called DS106 wants your stats. And we sent it out to people who were playing in the open DS106. And uh, this is kind of a cool thing. People, not a lot of people know you can do this. But when you pull in uh, data into a Google spreadsheet, Google Spreadsheets actually has a built-in widget that allows you to very easily map that data. Um, so we put together a DS106 map. Um, the information is unencrypted, and I need to approve that. It takes a little while to load, because it's uh, a little bit um, data heavy. Um, but what it does is it shows us kind of where all over the world the people who were following along, who, who answered the form, um, are located. So that was kind of a cool thing. And then we decided, so there they are. You can see them. There's a lot of people in, um, in North America, obviously, but we also have some in Europe, some in Australia, over um, in Indonesia and in Japan. Um, but we also put together, um, where is it, DS106 by numbers. So we put together this Google Doc towards the end of the semester, because one of the things we didn't really get into that we wanted to have our students do was infographics. And we kind of had an idea that maybe we'd have them do this as the final exam, but they all wanted to make movie posters about Jim Grumman instead. So, <laughs> so we, we, so, but we do have these numbers, and I do think they're pretty impressive. So I'll show this to you, and then we'll open it up for any questions. Um, the total posts over the course of the semester between my section, Jim's two sections, and all of the people playing along where we had, as of noon on 427 was 3,530 posts that had been um, uh, aggregated into the course site. Total comments, which we also were able to track because of some magic that we did with, um, did a lot of magic. with, with, with Yahoo Pipes, um, was about 7,087 comments. Um, there were 2,093 categories that people had used, or tags that they had used to identify um, their content. Uh, one of Jim's students, this guy Aaron, um, actually got really into um, analyzing the data and, and uh, f for DS106 radio. So he was actually able to tell us um, the number of live radio occurrences, which basically just means somebody had logged in and taken the stream and done a live show. It could have been five minutes, it could have been an hour, but it gives us some idea. Um, and there were 6,489 <laughs> live radio occurrences um, since January. And total TV time, we had about 20 hours, and that started later. So. But that was with um, 87 videos and about 5,000 total views. We had 813 photos that people tagged in Flickr for DS106. Um, videos, 160 um, YouTube videos, also some Vimeo videos as well. Um, we, as, as of that date, we had 117 submitted assignments. That was the assignment thing we showed you. Um, and completed assignments, people who actually took that assignment and did it, we had about 250 of those. Um, we also actually had a rating system where people could come in and rate the assignments. So those were the top rated community assignments. We, we used Delicious. People bookmarked a variety of resources, so we also had some of those. Um, we started to, oh, countries represented by participants, US, Canada, Portugal, Australia, UK, Indonesia, Japan, Spain, New Zealand. And then the top 10 countries represented by site visitors. You can see those as well, because we, we did do Google Analytics on the, on the course site. Um, number of syndicated blogs on the course site was 177 at the end of the semester, but there were 366 registered users. These were the most prolific DS106 bloggers. We wanted to reward them. Uh, we never got this stat, the number of videos blocked for copyright violation on YouTube. Um, and then these are just the overall Google Analytics stats. So that gives you some idea of kind of the breadth um, of, of participation. Um, and what was generated out of the course um, that we were able to kind of gather at the end in a very unscientific way at the end of the semester. So we have about 10 minutes left. Do you want to answer any questions? There's, we could talk about this for like an hour and, well, 
all day. Um, but that wouldn't be very useful. So one point that was interesting that you brought up, and I'll actually just keep that, talk about it. Is um, Aaron Clemmer, who's a, who just graduated. He was a computer science major. He's a great, great student. Um, he obviously he knew what he was doing with computer programming. And so there was a community out there that was basically, Alan Levine in particular, was basically like, hey, Aaron, you think you can make a Twitter bot that shows every occurrence of DS-106 radio as a Twitter bot? And Aaron's like, I think I can. Three hours later, he creates a Twitter bot for the class that's showing us every song or every occurrence that happens. Then he uses that Twitter bot to analyze the data to give us this whole long idea. And I'm thinking about this is a computer science student working in the wild with people he doesn't know to create these awesome things. And you know, for him, it was remarkable because he hadn't thought about doing any of this, but the occurrence that arose that no one planned gave this student some real life experience. And also, Alan Levine is a very good programmer, although he doesn't talk about it. He was talking to Aaron about things I couldn't and giving him advice. And kind of us letting go and letting yeah. people who were good at what they do rise and help out the students I, changed everything for I us. I actually joke that Alan Levine um, actually taught the class more than me in yeah. some ways. But he stepped up and he did that because he was so um, invigorated. And the other one other thing I wanted to mention is there's been some conversations about Twitter and its usefulness or lack thereof. Um, and I have to say, there was, a, there was a moment like in the middle of the semester where I was like, how did this happen? Like, how did we get here that we have all these people following along and they care so deeply about DS-106? And I realized that if you trace it back, what it really comes down to, and it's not so much my Twitter network, because I'm not as active on Twitter as Jim is, but it really was Jim putting a call out on Twitter. And that was what generated this kind of like wave of interest and participation. So as much as yes, people do, tweet about like what they're having for breakfast. Um, I actually kind of like that because it makes me feel like I know something about somebody. But, but there's also something else that's going on here when, you, when you, you invest in a tool like that for long enough and you build that network and you participate in it and you contribute, it gives back to you in amazing ways. And what it gave back this semester was un, immeasurable. It could not have happened. Like this could not have happened if that network didn't exist. So, yeah. Jeff, do you want the... Okay. Did you have any concern about the outcome? Oh, yeah? Yeah, because people are, people care what you say, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just putting you in. Anyway, um, was there any concern about the outside world drowning out the participants in the class or any evidence of that? Well, you know, I, I'll let Martha speak to this too. At the beginning, you couldn't. At the beginning, you couldn't tell who was a student at Mary Washington and who was part of the open class. And that I kind of liked, because the two melded together. And the students ultimately for UMW, because the open students did what they wanted, then left. And that was the idea of it. Like Noam was saying, they're not getting a grade. They're not, I'm not evaluating their work. They do what they want, then they go. And there was no hardship there. So the UMW students finally took over the stream towards the end of the semester. But in the beginning, there was this great kind of mashup of, I don't know if this student's part of Martha's class, is from Indonesia, or is part of my. And so it kind of gave this idea of a community that came out of nowhere in some ways and like immediately you had these people commenting, Alan Levine was commenting on students work, students were commenting on Alan Levine's work, I mean they were kind of pushed out of the idea of this is your class. And, and I think the other thing that I, because we were both teaching and Jim was teaching one section online, there was already this aspect of the class that involved people outside of the room, do you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't think my students even really noticed. I mean, they just expected it. It was kind of funny. They were just like, well, I guess this is a class where lots of people comment. <laughs> you know? and, and they didn't really pay a lot of attention to like, is this a Mary Washington student or somebody in and Indonesia? It, it was amazing. If you look at the stats, I mean, there was a student in, in the face-to-face -face class who came in and she was like, I just wrote a post and it was kind of about nothing and 13 people commented <laughs> on it. I mean, if you're a teacher and you've worked with blogs and you get 13 comments on a throwaway post, you know your students changing everything. They're like, okay, people are reading. I gotta change the whole way I approach this. I have an audience. And yeah, yeah the audience, and Martha has theorized so much of this about the habit of daily creation, about the idea of audience. I mean, if you read her blog as she's getting ready for DS-106, it's all right there, the theoretics. And the idea that we built in an audience and they were part of that audience as well as part participants in the creation 
I really think changed the dynamic in ways. This was the single greatest professional experience I've ever had in terms of just watching what I've been talking about, with te about teaching to faculty come to life for me in that way. It was just amazing. Um, so how do you do it again? What do you got for us next time? <laughs> no, I, I actually, you know, I actually have an answer for that, even though you're being snarky. I am. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm. T but I'm, I knew one of you would. I know. I'm. Well, I start teaching it again on Monday for the first five weeks, and then Jim teaches it second session in an online format. Um, and honestly, what I what I kind of learned, especially as a first time instructor, <laughs> was. Um, that I don't know, <laughs> especially with a class like this, that it's as much as being open to that as it is about going into it saying, I hope something great happens. Um, we could never have anticipated what came out of this. And will the same level of amazingness happen? That's not the point, really, um, because I've learned that lesson. And I understand, too, sort of what that magic was, like what it, it, it helped me understand so much better about what I was doing as the instructor of the class. Um, that I know will, will, I will bring to bear if I teach it again, no matter what. And if something magical happens in the Minecraft server, cool. That's right. Minecraft is the next thing. Yeah, we Minecraft is the next thing. We have a whole world of Minecraft, and Lee, who's taking the class this summer online, has already been building me a house in Minecraft. I mean, that's, she's going to get credit for it. Right? <laughs> but the idea here is that we don't know, but we want platforms to experiment with. And the other thing is, one of the ideas I was thinking about, this is my first time teaching an online course, and I'd never done it before. I talked a lot about it. But doing it, I found that online students talk about independence. They did their stuff. They came to me and said, hey, it's done. If they came to my office, they had a question. I was amazed at how independent they were and how much they went to Google, all those things we said you should do, they did. And so next, this summer, I had thought about, played around with the idea of teaching the entire class in character. I don't know, have any of you seen David Cronenberg's Videodrome? <laughs> Videodrome is an interesting movie. It's all about flesh and technology and the two becoming part. It's kind of like Marshall McLuhan, his theories come life. Well, there's a guy, a character in that film called Dr. Oblivion. And Dr. Oblivion's whole idea is that he only ever shows up on screen. You can never see him in the real life. So he'll go to a talk show host and they'll put a TV down and they view him. The film takes him on that. So I love the whole idea of using DS-106 TV as Dr. Oblivion. I only show up on screen. I'm only this kind of disembodied figure. But through the work that Timmy Boy has done, or Tim Owens has done, we can now pull all the students into a TV show via Skype and have them be part of a process that's, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to do it completely in character. That's kind of a lot of work. And, and Tom was like, are you sure? Tom Woodward was like, are you sure you want to do that totally in character? Isn't this like your second online course ever? But I mean, I think, I think the idea is that, you know, Jeff is right. What is next? And you know what? What's next is what we imagine. That's what teaching should be. And you know, another thing that I was just thinking of that was an important component, and this was something that I totally didn't really expect or understand when it was happening. And I actually thought about doing a lightning slide this year that was going to be like the 15 things I learned teaching for the first time, but I, I didn't get to it. But one of them was going to be how hard it is to eat your own dog food. Because one of the things that Jim and I do try to do, and I have to admit, I did a pretty good job the first half of the semester, and then I got into planning faculty academy, and it was harder, was to do the same assignments as our students. Um, and at a certain point, I started to feel really guilty, because I wasn't keeping up. And then I kind of had to let that go, because I realized that that was just how the semester was going to be. But then I was like, how many other professors think that they have to do their students' assignments. I was like, that's weird. Why do I think I have to do that? Yeah. But at the same time, it was so good to do it when I was doing it. Like, that made me understand what was happening in the class in ways that I, I completely didn't anticipate. Yeah. Would this uh, be able to work with field trips? Like, when we go out on a field trip and there are some students who can't go because they have to work that day, and they can't be with us. So could they then view that and see what we've done on the field trip? Absolutely. I mean, one Jesus of the things Freddy. with one of the things with DS-106 radio that blew my mind, I'd never had a cell phone. Um, I was kind of like, whatever, I don't need one. I work five minutes away, you know. Um, but when I saw what DS-106 radio allowed with mobile devices, like, so say you go out on a field trip and you have half the class who can't come. 
The students could actually use their mobile devices, and it's pretty much an iPhone, an iPod, Android may work, an iPad, it doesn't matter. With a $2 app, they could actually broadcast what they're doing from the field. And you could have that not only broadcast it back to the students if they had a video camera or a, an iPhone with video, they could actually record what was happening and put it back on an archive somewhere that anyone else could share. And in terms of field study and stuff like that, that's a pretty remarkable thing that we're not even harnessing yet. So it really doesn't need to be uh, current time. No. Like we could record it, say, when we go to Costa Rica or places, and mm -hmm. then bring it back. We have it set up right now. Like, here's a cool example of the DS-106 radio had blown my mind. Here's a cool example. Anyone know of uh, Mike Watt? Mike Watt was in the Minutemen in the 80s, and then he actually went on to create his own band, Firehose. He's kind of a punk rock superstar, but he's a really mellow guy. So there's this guy, Noise Professor, who's out in Northern California, who's big into music, and he did this thing. He's like, man, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take my iPhone. And I'm going to record the Mike Watt show live. And then he took it from the Mike Watt show and put it back on DS-106 radio so anyone could listen to Mike Watt on the radio. And then I went in there and recorded the stream, and we now have an archive of a live version of a Mike Watt show. You think what deadheads would do if they had this kind of technology? <laughs> What we have here is completely open ground. And I don't care, digital storytelling is an example of this. But this might be where Mary Washington faculty start thinking about these tools, man, they're ubiquitous now. Students have smartphones. Maybe not every them, all of them, but enough. And how do we start experimenting with this in little ways? Not, you know, it doesn't have to be you have to go this route. You probably burn out like we did to some degree. But, I mean, how do we start using the media like audio and video to make those tools not a hindrance, as someone said earlier in the class, but a valuable tool for the teaching and learning and to realize that that tool they brought is going to bring something to the whole experience of teaching and learning and their education, right? Um, I thought one of the most illuminating things was a lot of students were afraid of the radio. They were really afraid. I mean, a community grew up around DS-106 radio that was not part of the students. They used it. They did some fun stuff with it. But that community was completely separate. And so it was interesting to me to think about why is that and what do we need to do to kind of think through that. Um, and Andy Rush has been talking about this again and again. You know, how can we use these tools like video and audio to start thinking about sharing the stuff we do at Mary Washington? Right? I mean, how crazy would it be for a faculty to sit down with a student and talk about a cool thing they did on video? And like, not grade them, but say, you did this awesome thing. Let's put this in and then put it on TV councils or on video live streams all over the web. Why are we doing this? It's easy. We've used up as much time as we can. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we have a, a big presentation now. Amanda's going to be um, delivering her plenary address. But I want to thank everybody for their attention. And if you have any other questions about this, we'd be happy to answer them. So thank you.